Let's record this and share my screen. All right, can you guys see this? Yes. Yes. Right, so, so my goal today is basically to run through uh, the manual, show you where I want you to be studying, and then explain some of the, the physiology of the different organs and glands of the male and female reproductive system. And we're going to finish off today with going over the physiology of the regulation of the female reproductive cycle. Um, and there's going to be several questions from that. Obviously, that's a little bit more complex than what goes on in the male. Uh, it's actually much more interesting physiologically as well. Um, so that we're going to end with that. And then I'll, I'll pull up the ovary model and show you what some of those changes are that go on cyclically in a non-pregnant female in the ovary. All right. Okay. So the reproductive system, as we all know, has uh, the primary role of allowing us to produce another individual. We reproduce, we have children, and you know, life goes on. We know that. In the, in the reproductive system, the organs can be classified as either a primary or secondary sexual organ. The primary sexual organs are the organs that produce the gametes. That is to say, the testicles produce sperm, we know that, and then in the male, and then in the, in the female, the ovaries produce the egg cells. So in the male, the primary sexual organ obviously will be the testes, that's plural, testis is singular. And then we have the secondary sexual organs. The secondary sexual organs are the, or, and glands and structures are the structures and organs that allow, at least in the male, the sperm cells to mature, be nourished, and be viable to fertilize an egg, number one, and number two, to transport the sperm in a viable format out of the male body to be deposited in the female reproductive system. So let's just go down these one at a time. And on the models, you would be identifying uh, these specific structures on the reproductive models after your class today when you go and review the models. So the epididymis, is a coiled tube. It's a tube, it's highly coiled. It actually lies just on the outside of the testicle, but still within the scrotum. Everybody knows the testicles are in the scrotum, uh, but lies on the top of the testicle. <clears throat> the epididymis is the place where immature sperm cells will be held for about 20 days or so while they complete their maturation process. So I'll mention it in a little while. When sperm cells are first produced, they're produced in an immature form. They don't have the ability to swim yet even, and they definitely don't have the ability to fertilize an egg, which is called capacitation. So after the sper immature sperm cells can grow their tail, then they they swim to and are held in place in the epididymis. So the more mature cells in the epididymis will leave the epididymis upon the male ejaculation, sexual arousal and ejaculation to ultimately leave the body and to be deposited in the female reproductive system. The sperm cell leave the epididymis and enter the vas deferens. <clears throat> now the vas deferens is a tube that's connected to the epididymis. However, it's not coiled, like the epididymis is coiled. This is more of a straight tube. It's surrounded by smooth muscle. Um, and during a male orgasm, smooth muscle rhythmically contracts around that tube to propel sperm through the tube. This is the, this is the tube or the duct that they cut during a vasectomy so that a male cannot impregnate a female. So this is the tube that actually gets cut. Now, as we know, the testicles are on the outside of the body. So this tube actually has to enter the body first. There's a little cord that leads from the testicle 
and allows the tube, blood vessels, and nerves and lymphatics to enter and leave the male body internally to externally. So the vas deferens actually enters the male body. The sperm cells are leaving the epididymis, going through the vas deferens and entering the body. Once they, this vas deferens actually courses posteriorly to the bladder, to the urinary bladder. And on that posterior side of the bladder, the sperm cells leave the vas deferens and enter a tiny little duct called the ejaculatory duct that then deposit the sperm into the urethra. Now the urethra is in the male is used for both the reproductive system and the urinary system. So obviously the urethra is a final tube. It goes out through the penis and a male can urinate. We all know that. But also in the male, that urethra is the tube, the final tube that the ejaculate is going to leave the male body. And the ejaculate contains the sperm cells that ultimately travel through these tubes and ducts and into the urethra. However, the ejaculate is not just sperm cells. It's a collection of fluid from sexual glands. So the largest of the sexual glands are the seminal vesicles. They are paired and they lie on the back side or the posterior side of the urinary bladder. They produce about two thirds of the volume of the ejaculate. So they produce the majority of the volume of the ejaculate. We're gonna talk about these glands in a minute. And then the gland that most people know about is a prostate, typically because as males get older, Elderly men sometimes have problems with their prostate. I think you guys are aware of that. Um, so the prostate can enlarge and put pressure on the urethra. The prostate is a single gland that's shaped like a donut. It actually circles around the urethra just inferior to the urinary bladder. And so when the prostate in some men as they get older enlarges, it may be a benign uh, situation, or it may be a cancerous tumor. The prostate can enlarge, put pressure on the urethra, and the male has a hard time going to the bathroom. I think you guys know a little bit about that. So, but the prostate is a sexual gland. It produces secretory products, just like the seminal vesicles do, that are important in the viability of sperm. So all of the secretory products from these glands are there in order to protect the sperm and allow the sperm to effectively be deposited in the female reproductive tract and thus be capable of fertilizing an egg. And we're going to talk at least about those uh, secretions a little bit in a minute. And then the last glands that we have in the male system are called the Cowper's glands. The other name for them are called bulbourethral gland. On the practical, you can write either name when you go to identify them. I know both names, it's fine. Um, and the Cowper's glands are paired. They actually lie just beneath the uh, prostate on either side of the urethra. So they're paired and they produce a uh, fluid that lubricates the urethra and raises the pH. And I'll talk about that. And then the penis has the job of depositing uh, the ejaculate in the female reproductive system as far as reproduction is concerned. And the scrotum is the sac that houses the testicles on the outside of the body. So uh, before I move forward, that, does anybody know already why the testicles have to be on the outside of the body? I mean, let's face it, the female ovaries, which makes the egg cells are in the inside of the body. So why are the analogous gonads in the male have to be on the outside of the body. Does anybody know that already? Because of the temperature? Very good, Marcius, because of the temperature. So sperm cell production is very sensitive to high temperatures. And as it turns out, the internal body temperature is just two to three degrees too high for an, a viable sperm cell to be produced. So in a little bit, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you the name of a muscle that you're going to be identifying on a model as well, that has the job of raising and lowering the testicles to and from the body. 
if it gets cold, the, te- the muscle contracts and it pulls the testicles closer to the body. So it warms them up. And if it gets too hot, the muscles relax and the testicles fall a little bit more away from the body to cool off. So it's a way of regulating temperature a little bit more effectively for viable sperm production, right? Now, um, as far as secondary sexual characteristics go, this is what happens at puberty with a barrage of hormones like the sexual hormones like testosterone in the male, estrogen, progesterone, all of those in the female. So obviously we've all gone through puberty happens in preteen to the teenage, teenage years. Females typically go through puberty earlier than males do. Um, but there's changes in body size, hair distribution patterns on males to females. Uh, males have lower voices, typically, we kind of know that, than females. And then the reproductive organs are growing and increase in size, right? And the, the, the main thing that happens at puberty, besides the secondary sexual characteristics that are being developed in our body, which are somatic changes, by the way, is that the individual becomes sexually mature and is able to reproduce. So before puberty, reproduction is not possible. At puberty and thereafter, an individual is viable to reproduce. So the secondary sexual characteristics basically are the characteristics that will alert another individual that they are sexually mature and able to reproduce, right? If you want to say it in a very bland way. Um, Now, Uh, This little paragraph talks about the muscle I just mentioned. It's in here somewhere. Here it is, cremaster muscle right here. That cremaster muscle are muscle bands that surround the testicle and go up the spermatic cord. And so you'll see that on a model. And like I said, if it gets cold, the muscle contracts and pulls the testicles towards the body. And if it gets too hot, they relax and lowers the testicles away from the body in order to maintain this lower temperature of the testicles just below body temperature, all right? Now, inside the testicle, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute after we get done. If we looked at a cross section through the testicle, you would see a whole bunch of little tubes. Those tubes, many of them, are called seminiferous tubes. The seminiferous tubules are the areas where sperm cells are going to be produced through a process called spermatogenesis. So we have specialized cells that line the inside of this tube. Those cells that line inside of that tube are just generically called spermatogenic cells, which means the ability to generate sperm. The process by which the sperm cells are produced is a division process you learned about in general biology called meiosis. Now, not my goal in this lab to go over the different phases of meiosis again, right? But the meiotic process in both males and females is to produce the gametes. Now, here's the difference between males and females. In males, a certain spermatogenic cell has the ability to undergo mitosis, which is a cloning event. And since those cells can clone themselves, once a male reaches sexual maturity, from that point forward through his whole life, he's able to produce sperm cells. That is different for females. Females are born with designated amount of egg cells that can develop. And females only have a certain number of years that she's able to reproduce her reproductive years, because at the end of those years, you know, females go through menopause. We all know that. So at menopause and thereafter, the female is not able to reproduce because there's no more hormones being made in the ovaries and no more egg cells being produced. That's different for males because the spermatogenic cells can divide via mitosis as well, right? Now, 
besides having the spermatogenic cells lining the seminiferous tubule, there's also cells called sustentacular cells or serratoli cells. These, are the, these cells are actually helper cells that help nourish and allow the immature sperm to develop as they are being produced in the seminiferous tubule. So they're helper cells. These sustentacular cells will hold those immature sperm cells in place until they can grow a tail and then can swim down the rest of the tubular pathway. So immature sperm cells are called spermatozoa or spermatids, which I don't think they have that name in here, but spermatids or spermatozoa. These sustentacular cells also produce testicular fluid that is flowing down the length of these tubes. They also produce something, a receptor called androgen binding protein. Androgen binding protein is required for the cells to bind to testosterone. So that's actually the receptor for testosterone. And I'll mention this in, in a little while, but in the female, but if you remember follicle stimulating hormone way back in the endocrine chapter, Follicle stimulating hormone, one of its main roles is to get gamete production in males and females. So in the male, sperm production is at a maximal level when there, we have a presence of both follicle stimulating hormone and testosterone bound to the androgen binding protein. So that increases what is called spermatogenesis. So this is the term I used earlier, spermatogenesis. That's the production of the sperm cells. Now, the stem cell that ultimately starts to give rise to sperm cells has 46 chromosomes in its nucleus. 23 of those came from the mother, 23 of those came from the father of the individual. So when a cell in our body has two sets of chromosomes, one from each parent, and every single cell in your body has 46 chromosomes except for mature red blood cells and the gametes. Every other cell has them. All of those cells are called diploid. Now, the diploid cell will divide to produce the sperm cells and it, via meiosis. And in so doing, it reduces the number of chromosomes by half so that each individual sperm cell only carries 23 chromosomes. So when a cell has half of the number of chromosomes it's called haploid. So all the gametes are haploid. The egg cells ultimately end up being haploid. The sperm cells are haploid. And that's why when fertilization occurs, you gain 23 chromosomes from mom because there's only 23 in the egg and you gain 23 from the dad because there's 23 in the sperm cell. So when a sperm cell fertilizes the egg, you now have 46 chromosomes. Okay. So that's what haploid means. So spermatogenesis is occurring in the seminiferous tubules and they develop the immature sperm cells that the sustentacular cells or serratoli cells are going to nourish and allow those immature sperm cells to grow and develop and have the ability to swim, right? Now, because when a sperm cell is first produced, there's no, there's no flagellum. There's no tail. In fact, I don't know if you, I guess you may know. The only flagellated cell in the human body is a sperm cell. There's no flagellated cells in a female body. And so there's only one human flagellated cell and it's a sperm cell. So the sperm cells have the flagellum so they can swim ultimately. Now, lying on the outside of the seminiferous tubule. So you have a tube lying on the outside of the tube 
are special cells that produce testosterone. We learned about them in the endocrine chapter. I want you to know the name again. The interstitial endocrinocytes is what I called them back then, or the interstitial cells of Leydig. These are the cells that make testosterone. So I would like for you to know that again in the testicle. Obviously, all the, this is in the testicle. All right. Um, now, <clears throat> as far as the penis is concerned, there's a couple of things that I want to mention in this paragraph because you're going to be identifying them on a model. Um, you won't be identifying every single thing, but there are a couple of things that we have to, to know about. Number one, during male arousal, sexual arousal, obviously the, the penis becomes erect. So how does the penis become erect during sexual arousal? Well, there are special tissues in the penis that are called erectile tissues that fill up with blood. They engorge with blood through a vasodilatory process that's triggered by the parasympathetic nervous system. So the parasympathetic nervous system will fire impulses towards the penis during a male sexual arousal. And what happens there is that the arteries supplying the penis vasodilate. So they get bigger in diameter, allowing more blood volume to enter the penis. That blood volume is going to enter two different types of erectile tissue. One of the erectile tissues is directly circulating around in circles around the urethra and extends to the end of the penis at what people call the head of the penis, which is technically called the glands penis. So that erectile tissue is called the corpus spongiosum. So that's the erectile tissue in the middle of the penis that extends all the way to the glands penis, the head of the penis. However, and that's just a single erectile tissue. There's a pair of erectile tissues on the dorsal side of the penis, what we call the dorsum of the penis, through the body of the penis on the top. There's two erectile tissues that engorge with blood that causes the penis to become erect as well. And that is called the corpus cavernosum. Now, by saying corpus cavernosum, that's singular. Technically, since it's a pair, I can say corpora. I would replace this with an A on the end. Cavernosa with an A on the end would be plural in Latin. Corpora cavernosa is plural in Latin. So this is technically singular, but I'm not going to be that technical when I grade your practicals and whatnot. So these are the two erectile tissues that fill with blood to cause a temporary erection of the penis during male sexual or, uh, arousal. That is a parasympathetic reflex. However, the actual act of the male orgasm and ejaculation is a sympathetic reflex. The sympathetic nervous system fires and causes smooth muscle along the vas deferens to contract rhythmically, which ultimately pumps the semen. And this again is a collection of sperm cells and glandular secretions from those sexual glands, which we're about to cover. As the ejaculate out through all the ducts and through the urethra that exit the body to be deposited into the female reproductive tract. So that ejaculation process is a sympathetic reflex, not a parasympathetic reflex. All right. So let's talk about the glands a little bit since I already mentioned the ducts. There's, you can get everything you need to know for questions on the, on the physiology test uh, from this little paragraph dealing with the glands. So the seminal vesicles are the largest, they're a pair of glands, they're paired, they're the largest of the sexual glands in the male, and they produce the majority of the, the volume of the seminal fluid, about two thirds of it. I would like for you to know what is secreted from the seminal vesicles. We're not learning all of their functions, 
but I would like for you to know that it secretes fructose, mucus, buffers, clotting proteins, and prostaglandins right there. I'll just mention a couple of these uh, for you. Fructose is a sugar. It becomes a fuel source for the sperm cell to make ATP because the cell is going to need ATP to be able to swim. Um, mucus and, and, and buffers. These alkaline buffers are there in order to raise the pH in both the male system as, as the ejaculate is moving through the male, but also more importantly in the female reproductive tract in the vaginal canal. The vaginal canal has an acidic pH, which it can be detrimental to the viability of sperm. Sperm are sensitive to low pH. <laughs> so that, that pH environment has to be raised. So we have buffers in there, right? Um, we also then have the prostate gland. The prostate gland produces what is called prostatic fluid for after the gland's name, just like we have seminal fluid for the seminal vesicles, we have prostatic fluid. The prostatic fluid forms the, the other third or so of the volume of the ejaculate, right, of the seminal fluid that's going to be coming out. The prostate gland produces citric acid, proteolytic enzymes, kininogens, and prostaglandins. Now, I know right here it says, see your textbook for the functions. I'm not going to ask you the functions on the test, but you need to know what is being produced. Oh, I wanted to mention clotting proteins. That's why. So the clotting proteins that come from the seminal vesicles help coagulate everything together so that the sperm cells can be deposited effectively in one place in the vaginal canal in the female reproductive system. However, if the sperm cells are still caught up in that coagulated mixture of proteins, they won't be able to swim away to find the egg. So some of the uh, enzymes that are produced by the prostate gland helps break up that clot and freeze up all the proteins. Those are, that's what the proteolytic enzymes are for. They help break up that, that co coagulated um, uh, group of proteins so the sperm cells can then swim through the cervix, into the uterus, and then up a fallopian tube to find the egg. Now, the last gland in the male reproductive system is the Cowper's gland, or also I mentioned earlier, you can call it the bulbo-urethral gland. Now, the Cowper's gland produces mucus and these buffers, these alkaline buffers. And just before the male sexual orgasm and ejaculation, the Cowper's gland began to secrete this mucoid clear viscous secretion through the urethra. So that clear viscous mucousy secretion lubricates the urethra and the buffers in it raises the pH of the urethra. So we lubricate the urethra because this, the sperm cells in the semen, the ejaculate, are about to be propelled at a fairly high rate of speed through the tube. And if it's not lubricated, there may be some mechanical friction and damage to the sperm cells. So we have to lubricate the tube. And the last thing that came through the urethra before a male ejaculates is urine because the male urinates through it. So urine has a very acidic pH relative to uh, what sperm can be viable in. So the Cowper's gland secretion is going to raise the pH of the urethra. All of that is to protect the sperm cells, all right, from being damaged. So also the secretion that comes from the Cowper's gland in a layman's term is what people call the pre-cum. Um, and that is basically a protective secretion that allows the sperms to stay viable and be deposited in the female reproductive tract. So that's what all those glands are doing. Kind of interesting, all that stuff that has to be produced, right? Now, sperm cells have a couple of regions on them that you're probably gonna have to identify. And you can look up any picture of a sperm cell, whatnot, it has a head on it. That head group is where the chromosomes are located. The nucleus is actually called a pronucleus. 
But nonetheless, that's where the 23 chromosomes are going to be housed in the head of the sperm cell. Now, at the very tip of the head of the sperm cell is something called the acrosome. The acrosome. The acrosome contains enzymes that have to be released when the sperm cell finally meets the egg, the ovum because there's several layers of proteins and polysaccharides that surround the egg, protecting it. So in order for a sperm cell to fertilize an egg, which takes about 100,000 sperm to fertilize one egg, by the way, the sperm cell actually has to bore a hole through those outer layers. And so it bores a hole once it meets the egg the sperm goes through what's called an acrosomal reaction where the acrosome is, is activated and it begins to release the enzymes that can break down the sugars and proteins. Hyaluronidase and various proteases are some of the primary enzymes that will break down the outer layers of the egg so that the sperm can penetrate the egg and fertilize it. So that's what the acrosome is. Now, that's at the tip of the head of the, of the sperm cell. Just behind the head of the sperm cell, though, there's an elongated part that's called the midpiece region. And the midpiece region is where you find all of the mitochondria that will make the ATP for the sperm to be able to swim. Just behind the midpiece region containing all of the mitochondria is the flagellum and it arises as what is called the tailpiece. So the flagellum whips back and forth and allows the sperm cell to swim, All right? No big deal. Now, as far as the male ejaculate is concerned, the volume can range from 2.5 to five milliliters, just give or take, depending on how much fluid is being secreted from the glands. The pH of the ejaculate is above seven, so it's in an alkaline range and can range anywhere from 7.2 to 7.7, which this is a lot higher than the pH of the average uh, urine. Urine actually can range from 5.5 and 6 all the way up to 8. It depends on what's going on in the body. We'll talk about that next week. But typically, on average, the, the, the pH of urine is acidic. So that's why the Cowper's gland has to release their their buffers in that mucus to lubricate the urethra. There's about 50 to 150 million sperm per milliliter of ejaculate. So there's a lot of sperm, millions of them, right? And so that's pretty much it with the male system. So with the female system, females typically go through puberty a little bit earlier than males. Um, the organs are still classified as primary or secondary. The primary organ is the ovary where the egg cells will be produced. And the secondary organs are going to be the organs that allow sperm to reach the egg, allow the egg to be travel to be transported from the ovary, ultimately down to the uterus, and where the baby will develop and then be born. All of those and some glands that secrete some uh, viscous fluids uh, are all part of what we call secondary sexual organs. So the vagina is a receptacle for a sperm, really semen deposition from the male. The uterus serves two purposes. It allows for the baby to be developing in there, as we all know, but also is involved for the baby to be born with labor contractions and whatnot. The uterine tubes or fallopian tubes, as they are called, are the tubes that will transport the ovulated egg from the ovary down towards the uterus. Now, I will mention this. If there are sperm cells present in the female reproductive tract, they swim up the fallopian tubes. Now, 50% of the sperm go up one tube, 50% of the sperm go up the other tube, um, and typically a female will only ovulate one egg. There are some females that are multi-ovulators, but for the most part, they ovulate one egg, which only goes into one of the tubes. So 50% of the sperm are on a dead end road to not find the egg. 
Typically, the sperm cells find the egg and fertilize it in the fallopian tube. Then after fertilization occurs, when a sperm fertilizes the egg, it's called a zygote. That one single cell then divides over and over and over and over and over again. And it forms a mass of cells that is traveling down the tube. And that transport time for that fertilized egg, and then it's dividing over and over to reach the uterus and implant on the inside of the uterus for the baby to develop takes about five days, about a five day journey after fertilization. So ultimately we also have in a male and a female system, the mammary glands or the breast, which are involved in milk production for the baby to eat. And then some glands that are analogous to a couple of glands in the male system, the paraurethral glands and something called the greater vestibular glands. These are gonna produce viscous mucousy fluids that are going to be involved in lubrication during sexual intercourse, right? Now, females also go through the secondary sexual characteristical changes. I don't think I need to go through them. I, I think we all know, you know, distribution patterns of hair and fat around the body are different and the breast develop and all of that. So just read through that is fine. Now, I, I need to mention these terms. The female external anatomy is referred to as the vulva or the podendum. This is the other name. Now, the, the vulva consists of an area that is just superior to the labial folds in the pubic region, and it's called the mons pubis. This is typically where you would find in pubic hair and what's called the mons pubis. And there's a little fat pad there. Then there are two pairs of labial folds. The outer pair is referred to as a labia majora. And note, this is, this is plural right here. Labus majoris would be singular, but we have a pair of them. Well, I don't, but females do. So they're called the labia majora. The inner labial folds are referred to as a labia minora. Sitting just superior to the labia minora is the clitoris. The clitoris is the analogous part, reproductive structure in the female, analogous to the glands penis in the male. In fact, they have very similar tissues in them. So the clitoris can swell with some blood during female sexual arousal. And then there is the vestibule. The vestibule is the area just around the opening of the vaginal canal. And there's some vestibular glands there, like I mentioned earlier, that are in the shape of a V that, that go on either side of the opening of the vaginal canal. So that's called the vestibule, just at the opening of the vaginal canal. All right, let's talk about the ovary. And then we're gonna get into um, the female reproductive cycle. All right, talk about the ovaries and the uterus and the female reproductive cycle. So in a non-pregnant female, there are several developmental changes that occur in the ovary for the development of the egg, which is called an ovum, and its ovulation or the expelling of the egg out of the ovary. In a non-pregnant female, those developmental changes occur cyclically once a month. And on average, the average reproductive cycle is 28 days. Some females are just shorter than that, and some females are just longer than that. There are some that don't meet the 28-day scenario. However, in textbook uh, classification, we always go by this 28 days, even though some women might be a little bit longer than that with their cycle. So what happens in the ovary? Well, the ovary's primary job is to produce the egg cells and to produce the female sexual hormones. Estrogens, progesterone, also relaxin and inhibin are produced, right? So the process by which the egg cells are developing is referred to as oogenesis. 
So just like we had spermatogenesis occurring in the testicle, we have oogenesis occurring in the ovary. Now the ovary has an outer cortex. It's called the cortical layer. And on the inside towards the middle is the medulla. Lining the cortical region are little bitty structures called follicles. The follicles are the structures that contain the cells that produce the, the egg cells. So the, the cells that produce the egg cells, ultimately the egg cells are gonna be called the oocyte that are in different stages of development. We're not going through all of the stages of meiosis, meiosis again, but the meiotic process is going to occur in these follicles, all right, for the development of the oocytes. So as it turns out, female babies, just before they're born, little bitty follicles called primordial follicles have a cell in them that begin meiosis. They basically begin the development of what becomes the oocytes. However, that process is halted in prophase one. That's the first phase of meiosis. So after the, the female's born, all of those primordial follicles have started to develop and all of a sudden are halted at the beginning of meiosis one. Now, those primordial follicles will not begin to develop again to produce egg cells until the female reaches puberty. At puberty, with a barrage of hormones to regulate all of these steps, some of those primordial follicles will continue the meiotic process to produce the oocyte. However, only the largest of the, the couple that start to develop once a month thereafter puberty through the female reproductive years, a couple of those follicles begin to grow and develop but only the largest one continues to grow. The smaller ones degenerate and are reabsorbed by the ovary. And for that reason, that's typically why a female will only ovulate one egg. So during the reproductive years thereafter puberty, cyclically happening once a month, the follicle will develop, it will produce what is called a secondary oocyte that on the 14th day of a regular 28 day cycle will be ovulated or expelled from the ovary. Basically the egg is released. Hormones are going to control all of the female reproductive cycle. Estrogens, progesterones predominantly, but also relaxin and inhibin are gonna play a role. Relaxin is going to be more important at the time that the female has to give birth to a baby because that hormone is going to relax the pubic synthesis to allow the baby to come down through the birth canal a little bit more easily. Inhibin is a hormone that helps control the production and secretion of estrogen and progesterone. So these are the four principal hormones coming from the ovary, right? Now, the o in the ovary, the follicles are going to grow and develop at the time of ovulation on the 14th day of a regular 28 day cycle, the, the follicle ruptures open and it forms a little wound at the surface of the ovary. The, the ruptured open follicle is then referred to as the corpus hemorrhagicum. I'm going to show you that on the model. And then that corpus hemorrhagicum heals up and becomes the gland that produces hormones post ovulatory. And that's called the corpus luteum. Hold on one second, guys. All right, sorry about that. So the follicle grows develops the egg, the egg's ovulated, the ruptured follicle is called the corpus hemorrhagicum. The corpus hemorrhagicum heals up and becomes the corpus luteum. 
Ultimately, the corpus luteum is what's producing estrogens and progesterones after ovulation. The follicles themselves produce estrogen before ovulation. So I'm going to show you that on a picture. Now, the corpus luteum in a non-pregnant female is going to die in about two weeks. It's only viable for two weeks. In a pregnant female, it's viable for about another week or so because of the hormone that's tested on the home pregnancy test, which is called human chorionic gonadotropic hormone. That hormone maintains the viability of the corpus luteum for about another week until the fertilized egg can implant on the inside of the uterus. Um, now, in a non-pregnant female, this corpus luteum dies. It actually becomes scar tissue, which is called the corpus albicans. And then the process starts all over in a non-pregnant female uh, during the cycle. Now, the fallopian tubes carry that fertile, uh, the, the ovulated egg down towards the uterus. It's also typically the site of fertilization. And the egg is drawn into the uterine tubes and flows down a little current because the fallopian tube is lined by a simple ciliated columnar epithelium. Those cilia beat and creates a current, a fluid that always flows down towards the uterus. So the egg is flowing downstream towards the uterus. The sperm cells have to swim upstream to get to the egg, right? Now, <laughs> let's talk about the female reproductive cycle. I'm gonna mention this uterus, uh, uterine changes right now, but typically the uterine changes occur because of a thickening and a thinning of what's called the stratum functionalis in the endometrium. So I'm going to mention how that occurs uh, in a second. Before we do that, though, I want you guys to go to this paragraph when you're home studying and just review the periurethral gland right here and the greater vestibular gland. Notice they have other names, either the Skeen's gland or the Bartholin's gland. So just review those two uh, female sexual glands out of this paragraph. All right, the last thing that I want you to look at in this chapter is the female reproductive cycle. So before I show you the pictures and go over it, I'm gonna go over their name. So we have to know the names of the part of the cycle and you have to know the days with which in it, it occurs. So the female reproductive cycle is really separated into two cycles. One is called the ovarian cycle, and that includes all of the changes that occur in the ovary over the course of those 28 days. We also have the menstrual cycle or the uterine cycle, as I like to call it, and that is going to include the phases and all of the changes that occur in the uterus over the course of those 28 days. So it's still the female reproductive cycle. And we're having changes occur between the ovaries and the uterus collectively together during that time. So the first phase of the over ovarian part of the cycle is called the follicular phase or the preovulatory phase. And that'll, that phase occurs from day one all the way to day 13. So the first 13 days of the cycle is what we call the follicular phase. It's called the follicular phase because during that time is when the follicles are developing and growing to allow the egg to develop. That's why we call it follicular. Now, on the 14th day, and I'm going to tell you about all these hormones in a second. On the 14th day, that's called ovulation. And this is on a, a regular 28-day cycle. So on that 14th day, the egg will be expelled from the ovary, which we call ovulation. On day, the last 14 days after ovulation all the way to day 28, it's called the luteal phase or the post-ovulatory phase. Now it's called the luteal phase because during that time, the corpus luteum is developing and is developed really, and is the structure that produces estrogen, progesterone, and the other female hormones 
post-ovulatory. So pre-ovulatory, all the hormones come from the follicles. Post-ovulatory, the hormones come from the corpus luteum. Now, not follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Those come from the pituitary gland. When I say the hormones, I mean estrogen and progesterones, right? So the ovarian hormones. Now, as far as the uterine cycle is concerned, the very first five days of the cycle is called the menstrual phase. That's when the menses is coming. And the menses is the shedding of the innermost layer of the endometrium. And the innermost layer of the endometrium of the uterus is called the stratum functionalis. So this is the tissue that's on the very inside of the uterus that gets thicker at a part during a part of the cycle and then starts to die off in a non-pregnant female. And that tissue is what becomes the menses in a non-pregnant female. So after that, day six through 13, that's called the proliferative phase. It's called that because the stratum functionalis is growing and getting thicker, ultimately due to high levels of estrogen coming from the follicles from in the ovary in that pre-ovulatory or follicular phase of the ovarian cycle. Then we have ovulation on day 14. There's no major changes occurs in the uterus. The uterus is not involved in that ovulation, but on day 14, that's just, again, we still call it ovulation. Now, day 15 through the 28th day, the last day, is called the secretory phase. It's characterized by a continued thickening of the stratum functionalis that is promoted by high levels of progesterone and estrogens. These are coming from the corpus luteum. So as long as the corpus luteum is viable, progesterone and estrogen stay high and the stratum functionalis stays thick and is able to allow for the fertile egg to be implanted, right? So those are the phases and here's what it looks like in the picture. You can really learn everything from the picture if you wanted to, but I'm, you need to go review the characteristics of those changes. So let's just talk about it for a second. How does all of these changes occur anyway? Well, they won't occur until the female is at puberty and thereafter for sure. But it occurs because of release, a release of a bunch of hormones. Ultimately, we have the gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus, if you remember that from exercise one. That is going to be released to cause the anterior pituitary gland, specifically gonadotrophs, will release follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Follicle-stimulating hormone has the job of causing these follicles to begin to grow and ultimately will start to induce them to produce estrogens. Same thing with luteinizing hormone. Luteinizing hormone's role is to stimulate estrogen production at, on the pre-ovulatory phase. However, so you see right here from day one to 13, that's all what we call pre-ovulatory. The uterus, the uterine changes down here, the ovarian changes up here. So this is called the follicular phase, the first 13 days of the cycle for the ovaries. But on day 14 is ovulation. That egg cell that is ovulated is not even a mature egg cell yet. It's called a secondary oocyte. It hasn't completed meiosis two yet. <clears throat> In fact, it won't complete meiosis two until and if and ever when sperm cells are in the female reproductive tract and approaching and, and trying to fertilize the egg. But nonetheless, before ovulation, all of the estrogens that are required for the growth of the uterus come from the follicles that are growing. But look what happens at ovulation. This follicle ruptures open. And this happens at the surface of the ovary, by the way, and expels the egg out. We call that ovulation. Once that happens, this ruptured follicle becomes what's called the corpus hemorrhagicum. The cells of the corpus hemorrhagicum grow and get bigger, and this heals up, and this structure becomes the corpus luteum. 
<coughs> Excuse me, I need something to drink. Hold on. All right. So, the corpus luteum is a hormone producing structure in the ovary that was developed from the ruptured follicle called the corpus hemorrhagicum. The corpus hemorrhagicum used to be the follicle where the egg was developing. So the developmental sequence occurs just like we see here over the course of 28 days in a non-pregnant female. The primordial follicles begin to develop and grow. One of them continuously grows the largest one. So we go from prime, uh, primor, primordial follicles to what we call primary follicles. The primary follicles are developing one of them continues to grow, which we then call a secondary follicle. That grows and gets bigger and becomes the mature graphene follicle. That's the names. <coughs> and then the egg is going to be ovulated from the mature graphene follicle. That's called the corpus hemorrhagicum. That heals up and becomes the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum is what produces progesterone and estrogens after ovulation. So before ovulation in the ovary, the hormones come from the follicles. After ovulations, after ovulation, the hormones come from the corpus luteum. Now in a non-pregnant female, this corpus luteum only lives for, for about two weeks, give or take, and then it's going to die and become non-viable. It actually becomes scar tissue called the corpus albicans. So Look what happens, and I'll, I'll come back to this in a second. Look what happens in the uterine changes. Um, oh, so we had follicular phase, ovulation, and luteal phase for ovarian phases of the cycle. In the uterine cycle, we have the menstrual phase. We then have the proliferative phase, and then the secretory phase. Ovulation, and then the secretory phase. So the first week or so of the cycle is where the inside of the endometrium, the stratum functionalis, is being shed as the menses. The reason why it's being shed is because at the end of a previous cycle, let's say way over here, the corpus luteum died. Progesterone and estrogens are now not being produced. In the absence of progesterone, the blood supply to the corp, uh, I'm sorry, the blood supply to the stratum functionalis dies off. These arteries called spiral arteries seal up. So all of this tissue dies, the very inside of the uterus, because the corpus luteum is no longer viable. Progesterone and estrogens drop drastically in concentration. So in the absence of progesterone, this stratum functionalis dies and becomes the menses of the next cycle. Now, over the course until the 14th day up until the 13th day that's called the proliferative phase the reason for that is because estrogen first and then progesterone cause the stratum functionalis to start to grow and get thicker this tissue gets thicker then we have ovulation no typical changes occur in the uterus but thereafter we have a continuous steady thickening of the of the stratum functionalis and that's due to an increase in progesterone predominantly. And that's called the secretory phase. Now, what happens if the female is pregnant? Well, if the female is I think he just lost internet now.
Hello, can y'all hear me now? Yeah, I think you're looking at me. Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Very good. Yep. Uh, the same thing happened yesterday, but at least it only happened once today. Right. You were about to explain about um, about what happens when the woman gets pregnant. Okay, very good. Let's do that. Wait, how do I? Are we recording? We are. You just. Yes. We are okay, good. All right. Let's go back to this picture. All right. So. The reason why I was saying that is because in a non-pregnant female, this gluteus is what's supplying the horn, maintaining the life of the inside of the uterus. So in a non-pregnant female, this corpus luteum is going to die, which means progesterone and estrogens drop, which means that the stratum functionalis dies and becomes the menses. However, in a pregnant female, a female that becomes pregnant, the corpus luteum is actually maintained its viability is maintained for about another week because of human chorionic gonadotropic hormone. That's the hormone that's tested on the home pregnancy test. So one of his jobs is to maintain the secretion of progesterone from the corpus luteum until the fertilized egg implants on the, on the uterus and the, and the cells that start to develop into the placenta tissue will then take over the job of producing the progesterones and estrogens throughout pregnancy. So the corpus luteum will die, but it just takes longer for it to die until the placenta can take over hormone production. So that's the importance of progesterone. So you know, everybody's heard of the morning after pill. Those morning after pills are, or what I like to call abortion pills, unfortunately, those things what they do is they force a menses to come out. The reason for that is those morning after pills block progesterone's action on the stratum functionalis. So even if progesterone is present, if someone's on those medications, it, progesterone can't do its job and the stratum functionalis will die and become a menses. So if there's an fertilized egg, the fertilized egg is going to come out with that, that menstrual and the female won't be pregnant anymore. All right, so that's it for that chapter. What I want to do now before I field any questions from you is go to, let's see, go to our Quizlet. Now, I noticed yesterday in class, I didn't specifically have a Quizlet link in really in exercise set or exercise eight, but, oh yeah, it is right there reproductive system quizlet so i must have put it in there but if you ever need to you can scroll to the bottom i don't know if you ever did that yet and this is basically the link to my whole quizlet so i typically just click on that and pull all of them up and let it load up can y'all hear me yeah but you're breaking in and out uh, my internet's about to die again. <laughs> Hopefully I can get through this ovary model with you real quick. Mm -hmm. And I don't know in, in my course, I guess other people are able to post stuff. So people put like mitosis and stuff like that in here. Some of that stuff's not from me particularly. All right. Obviously I'm not doing developmental psychology. I don't know why that stuff shows up in my course. Um, but nonetheless, you can go to the folders over here. And you can click on any folder you want. So I'm going to click on the reproductive folder. I just wanted to cover two things briefly with you real quick. I want to show you what the testicle looks like in cross section. Uh, let's see, increase the size of this. All right. So if we take a cross section through the testicle, you can see there's a whole bunch of little tubes in here. It look like just circles. These are tubes that would come out of the plane of the board at us. So if we enlarge them, this is what they look like. This is a seminiferous tubule. The seminiferous tubule is where spermatogenesis occurs, which means that, and if you note it, if you look just along the perimeter, see darker dots, those are the spermatogenic cells called spermatogonium cells. They're diploid and they will start to migrate from the perimeter towards the middle of the tube. And 
they undergo meiosis as they're moving through the tube. They go through meiosis one, then meiosis two. By the time they reach the middle of the tube, the special cells in here, which we can't identify, called the, the serotoli cells, hold them in place until they grow tails and they can then swim down the tube. So this is where sperm production takes place, spermatogenesis. On the outside of the tube is where the interstitial endocrinocytes or the interstitial cells of Leydig are. So that's what these cells are and these cells and those cells, those produce testosterone. So that's where testosterone comes from. All right, let me pull up the ovary model. I wanted to show you <clears throat> on the model, some of the changes that I was just now referring to, right? So different things you're gonna identify on the model, something called the mesovarium, just a ligament and it's got uh, some blood vessels that run all through there. This is the ovarian ligament that attaches the ovary to the uterus. Um, and then we have all of these structures in here that you're going to identify, all right? The tissue on the outside that lines the outside of the ovary is a, is a simple cuboidal epithelium. It's called the, the germinativum or germinal epithelium. It's just simple cuboidal. You learned about name P1. Now, all of these other things are the changes of the follicles that take place. And here's what they are. So in the proliferative phase, the primordial follicles, these small follicles here, are going to grow and develop. And the cell is going to go through meiosis one and produce what we call a primary follicle. So we go from primordial to primary. The primary follicle is then going to develop into the secondary follicle. See how it gets a little bit bigger. Now, during that time, even though they don't show it, several of the primordial follicles begin to grow, but only the largest of them continue to grow because the other ones die off. So this represents a follicle that is dying off and being reabsorbed by the ovary. That's called an atretic follicle. So we go from, sorry, we go from primordial to primary to secondary. Now this secondary follicle continues to grow and it gets really big. It turns into this structure. This is actually the mature graphene follicle. It's actually already rupturing open to release the egg right here. And that egg cell is called a secondary oocyte. So at least on this model, I refer to this as a ruptured mature follicle or you can write ruptured graphene follicle because it's already rupturing to release the secondary oocyte right there. Now, once the egg cell is ovulated, this ruptured follicle, sorry, this ruptured follicle turns into this structure. This is the corpus hemorrhagicum. The corpus, hemor the corpus hemorrhagicum is called that because it forms a little blood clot in there. It's a little wound that happens right there. So it starts to heal up. The cells along the perimeter start to grow and get bigger. So this structure then turns into this structure, which is called the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum is what produces the progesterone and estrogens after ovulation, post-ovulatory. So before ovulation, the estrogens come from follicles. <clears throat> After ovulation, the estrogens and progesterones come from the corpus luteum. Now in a non-pregnant female, this corpus luteum is gonna die in two weeks and becomes this gray tissue here. This is called the corpus albicans. So just to let you know, this is a dead corpus luteum called the corpus albicans, which is scar tissue. This is also corpus albicans scar tissue, and this is scar tissue. All three of these in this model are the same, corpus albicans. All right, so that's about it. When you're later today, I want you to go back to the Quizlet and start you know, reviewing all of those models, unless you've already done that, <coughs> and continue to do so, and then complete the pre and post lab assignments. All right.